Let us pray. Father, we thank you for um, your word. Lord, we thank you that according to your providence, Lord, that we sang that word twice. And Lord, we are reminded, Lord, that your word is sure, that it provides us sure uh, footing that we can build our entire lives on. And Lord, we, as we come to your word now, Lord, give me um, the ability to speak clearly and concisely and boldly. But Lord, we do not come for my words, but we come for yours. Because Lord, your word is the only word that can change us and make us new. So Lord, we pray that um, as your word is preached, Lord, that um, you may change us um, and that we may look more like your son, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So a great philosopher once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, And that great philosopher wasn't a philosopher, it was Mike Tyson. And before a boxing match the night before, um, the, the reporter asked him about his opponent. How are you going to deal with this opponent? What if he goes left? What if he goes right? What if he does a a jab or a hook? How are you going to approach this opponent? And his response was, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. That is to say that we have hopes of something kind of going the way that that we would like it to go until those hopes get dashed. Ultimately, we get punched in the face. And if we're honest, many of us, um, if we're honest, have been punched in the face. Maybe not physically, but by life's situations, right? Many of us have hopes into something or have hopes into something and then only for that hope to come crumbling down. We are hopeful creatures, right? We hope in something from, from, from something silly like hoping for... Tottenham or a football team to win and to finally bring a trophy. We hope in a first date leading to a marriage. We hope for interviews, right? We hope to get a particular job by the way that we've spoken or the way that we have conducted ourselves or our experience. We hope in so many things and more seriously, we hope in things like we hope that our wandering child can come back. We hope that our children may come to the Lord. We hope that our health begins to improve. And the kind of result of being in a fallen world is ultimately our hopes, for the most part, tend to not really be fulfilled. Right? We're constantly faced with disappointment again and again and again. And there's often three words that often change someone's destination of where they're heading. And those three words is I give up, right? Or I gave up. So I gave up on my faith. I gave up on my marriage. I gave up on my children. I gave up on my family. I just, I gave up. And when people say that, um, it often charts the destination of where they're heading to. They stop and they kind of let go of any striving and they just give up. But there was one word that if that was introduced to that particular sentence would change the direction of that. And that word is almost, right? I almost gave up. And in many ways that turns itself into a testimony service, right? Right, where we change the direction and it's this idea of hope, right? I wanna, turn to Luke chapter 24. So if we turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 24. And if if you are new here, um, if you could just grab the Bible um, in front of you and we will be in page 831. So 831. And we'll be reading from verses 13 down to 34. 
that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and be crucified and crucified him. But we have hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it was now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of, some of those were with us and went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognised him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Um, really beautiful narrative. I know even um, last couple of weeks, I know Israel was able to preach through Second Samuel. And last week, Pastor Ryan preached through Ezra and Nehemiah, kind of an overview. So today we're going to be looking at like another narrative, another story. And as you're reading, it's important to pinpoint the small details in every single story. Because that's what makes, makes a narrative. So we find ourselves at the conclusion of Luke's gospel, where we read that Jesus of Nazareth, was, 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 who healed the sick, who cast out demons, who raised the dead, uh, was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He was delivered um, to, to, to death. He was, he, 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 he was crucified under the Roman Empire. His body was taken by a rich man and, and, and was given and put in a, a tomb. And the immediate context of our verses, of our chapter is verses 1 to 12, right, where we read a group of women taking spices to the tomb and they arrive and it's empty. And they see angels and they pose a question to them saying, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Right? We, we say that all the time during Easter. And the women are frightened, they, 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 they kind of run away, they go to the disciples and they tell what's happened and the disciples don't really believe them. We read in verse 12 that they seem to them an idle tale, which basically means um, that they felt that it was nonsense. They didn't really believe the testimony of the, of the women. And it's good to note, um, in first century, um, first century Jerusalem, um, women didn't, weren't able to basically testify in Jewish court. Right, so Josephus, the first century historian, said that the witness of multiple women um, was not acceptable um, in that 
He says, because, quote, the levity and boldness of their sex. And Celsus, a critic of Christianity in the second century, said that Mary, uh, being a witness of the resurrection, was basically an hysterical female deluded by, by, by sorcery. Right. So in many ways, the response from the disciples was consistent with the kind of current culture of where they were in. Now, if the resurrection was an elaborate plan, and this is a good apologetic to, to, to kind of gifted people, that if the resurrection was an elaborate plan made by the disciples and it was fake, the one thing you don't do when you're trying to make a plan like this is to have women be the first people to see Jesus. But that undermines completely the credibility to others of the, of the, of the, of the, of the resurrection of Jesus. Right? So we have to be reminded that we're looking at not a story, not a um, kind of fun story that Luke kind of created, but this is an actual historical account that actually happened. These things didn't just happen somewhere and it was kind of stored in the book. No, it was actually happened. The Road of Emmaus story is God's account of two disciples walking with the Lord Jesus, right? These are the very words of God. So what happens, Peter goes to the tomb, he looks in, it's empty, and no one's there, but he can't see Jesus. So what rumours started spreading around the disciples. The women are saying that he's alive, the tomb is empty, and these rumours start circulating throughout all of um, Jerusalem. And what happened is these two um, Emmaus Christians, or the disciples, ended up walking back home to their village, right? So... There's three different states to this particular story. So verses 13 to 27 is the journey to Emmaus. So from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Verses 28 to 32 is the supper at Emmaus. And in verse 33 to 35 is a journey from Emmaus, right? So Jerusalem, this is quite complicated. Jerusalem to Emmaus, supper at Emmaus, and from Emmaus to Jerusalem, right? So it's like round trip. And my kind of goal this morning, Lord willing, is to kind of show this narrative and to show you how the Lord deals with our hopelessness, in which we all encounter on an everyday basis, and to provide a better hope for us and to put that hope in our mouths so when we go, we can, we can spread that hope. So let's, let's, let's look at the initial journey to Emmaus. So they're walking and we read that it's a seven-mile journey. Right, so I'm not sure if we have any runners here. Um, I've never ever ran seven miles, which is prophetic, but seven miles uh, it takes around two and a half hours walking. So if a healthy adult male, and I'm not, I'm not sure I'm healthy, so I can sit longer, but it's two and a half hours walk for a healthy male to walk this distance. Right? So this journey is quite long, if they're walking. Which is to say, this entire journey was two hours and 30 minutes. And this journey was marked by hopelessness. Their master and their Lord just got crucified a couple of days ago. And they literally built their entire lives around this person. And now all they know up to this point is that he has died. Right? There is no hope. And verse 15 reads that two of the disciples were talking and the risen Lord Jesus approaches them. Right? He encounters them. On, on, on the way to the, the village, but his identity is kept from them, right? So to them, he's just a fellow traveler walking among them and he's nothing special, he's not Jesus, he's just walking along with them. And Jesus asks us two, two questions, right? Um, and you can probably picture just their heads down, right? Just like walking down, heads down, devastated at what's happened over the last few days. And as they even saw Jesus on the cross, they might have even had Deuteronomy 21 in their, in their minds. Cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. Right? They're, they're, their master and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is now cursed as he hanged on a tree, not knowing that Christ became a curse for us. Right? We, we know things in hindsight, but in this very moment, they're just aware of his death. Have you ever hoped in something, with every fiber in your being, that you wished to be true, only to be let down, only to have your kind of hopes dashed. Right. This speaks to the human experience, right? Many of us put our hopes in something. 
Verse 17 reads this. What is this conversation that you are holding as you walk, as, as walk with each other as you walk? With, with the response from Cleopas saying, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that had happened in these days? And Jesus says, what things, right? And it's ironic how Jesus in, has been in the middle of all that's taken place, but he's asking questions about what's happened. And he does this all the time throughout the gospel where he asks questions and his purpose is to initiate conversation and to basically reveal the heart of either the person speaking in order for them to kind of reflect on what they said. This is the same thing happened at the woman at the well. It says, give me a drink. Or, that's a question. Give me a drink. And what's happened is the longest conversation that's recorded in the New Testament is from that initial question. Right? So what happens here, Jesus asks two questions and the content of the people's hearts are exposed. So we read in verse 21 that they were disappointed, and we read, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They hoped that he would come and to overthrow the Roman Empire, um, bring Israel back to where it needed to be, and and, 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 and they could reign. Their hope was something that was on this, and it was eliminated. Now, when you read the Old Testament, there is many prophecies and many words that speak to this reality, right? But their hope was built on something partial. It wasn't something that was full, right? So we know, in hindsight, we know that Christ's death and resurrection was the very means that he was to redeem Israel and also the other nations of the world. But their hope was still... Um, set on, on a partial truth. They had a misplaced hope on something that wasn't full. Christ was indeed the one. Right? There wasn't another one. He was the one. And he was the one to redeem Israel and all other nations of the world by his death on the cross. And Peter, um, in, in, in Acts in Pentecost, said this, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite, definite plan and foreknowledge of God. When Jesus was on the cross, these disciples may have thought everything was wrong, but Christ and the Lord knew exactly what was happening. Everything was was according to plan. So the biggest problem for these disciples wasn't the Roman Empire, wasn't even their their, their yoke or the bondage that they were in, but that they needed to be reconciled to a holy God. God was a problem for them in their sin. And Christ came to to deal with that problem. Now, I love um, Christ's response in verse 25. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, i.e. the entirety of the Torah, he interpreted the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So the way that Christ deals with their hopelessness isn't by bringing new ideas or new ways of thinking, but by expositing scripture, right? by opening in God's word and exposing the meaning of what God's word says. Right? Jesus Christ is the best expositor. Right? It's not Charles Spurgeon, it's not kind of your favorite preacher, it's, it's Christ. Christ was able to interpret the scriptures faithfully and it pointed to himself through all of what was said in the Lord's word. Right. Now, when we think about our, mis- our misplaced hopes, when we, when we build our hopes on something that's, com- that's different or um, that's kind of not him, we need God's word to deal with, with that. Right. When I put my hope, my sole hope, on let's say on my m- marriage or on my family or even my work, what happens is that when things start to change, right, our hope starts to shift. Right? We become hopeless. We feel like this is all there is. But when, it's, when our hope is something that's so sure, when, when these things start to shake or start to have friction, we're able to stand sure. We're able to stand. Romans, Romans 15, 4, 5 reads, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. 
It's God's word. It's, it's, it's the prophets. It's Moses. It's, it's all of the Torah that provides us with hope in order for us to make, um, to make progress and ask us to not fail. Right? So that's the journey, right? So their journey from Emmaus was one in which they were hopeless, they were frustrated, they were sorrowful, and this random fellow traveller opened up the Torah and expounded them, expounded those words to them. So how about we look to the supper at Emmaus, right? So the verse 28 to 32. So the two disciples and Jesus approached the village of Emmaus and Jesus acted like he was going farther. And I, this small detail is quite interesting. It's almost like Jesus was basically walking. And I think Jesus probably wanted to be invited, I'm not sure, but he acted as if he was going to go further. And of course, the disciples um, kind of urged him, saying, please, come, come with us. And it's, it's, it's interesting that the, the disciples didn't see him for who he was, right? But their eyes betrayed their longing hearts. Like they, they, they longed to be with this person, but they didn't really know who he was. Right? They wanted to have more time with this fellow traveler. The, their eyes betrayed their longing hearts. They longed to be in the presence of their master. Right? And then, Maybe it was the, the type of teaching that they received on the journey, or maybe it was just his presence. They wanted to be there. Even though they didn't know who he was, to them he was just a stranger. They wanted to be in his presence. So they urged him, please stay with us. And of course, Jesus was walking. He said, like, okay, I'll, I'll come back. Because I, I wonder where he was going. <laughs> he, he appeared for these two disciples. But verse 30 reads, when he, was at the ta- when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Right? And if you know scripture, we know those words are quite, quite common. Right? Jesus would do this multiple times throughout the New Testament. And I guess the, the Last Supper might kind of come to mind. But this happened three days prior. So we're on Sunday morning and on Thursday, Jesus had the Last Supper. Right? And in that passage in Luke 20, 19, he, it reads, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it's ironic how as soon as the disciples received this bread, they remembered him. Right? They, they were able to recognize who Christ is. Right? The fellow traveler that traveled with them, that two and a half journey, ultimately was the one that they longed for. They, the very person that they spoke with, maybe, maybe even laughed with, maybe even cried with, was the very person that was walking with them. But also, if we actually go back into Jesus' ministry, um, he said these words during the feeding of, feeding of the 5,000, right? Where he, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and then he gave it to the, gave, gave it to the disciples, but we then gave it to the 5,000 people. And of course, the, um, set, the five loaves and two fish multiplied and basically in short everyone was was filled up everyone was satisfied right? this is a miracle right so these words in that passage preceded a miracle right jesus said this and what happened a miracle occurred and i think this is quite similar to what we see here jesus said these words and a miracle of new sight to these two disciples became a reality in one moment their eyes were opened, and he might even saw the, the nailed pierced hands as he gave them the bread. They might have even, even had the candle flicker where they can see the, maybe the marks of where the, 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 the um, nail, uh, not the nail, the crown of thorns maybe placed on his head. For a moment, they saw him, right? And this was a miracle because they were kept and prevented from seeing him clearly and beholding him, and yet, Christ, the sovereign Lord, willed it in such a way that they can see him and behold him. In that moment, they saw him. But we know that that, that, that moment didn't last long. We know that he vanished. And as I was studying this, I was wondering, why did Jesus go so soon? Why did he just suddenly bounce? We know, of course, the Lord has particular reasons as to why he does everything. He has particular places to be. 
I would maybe consider him withdrawing immediately, maybe give them time to reflect and meditate on what's just happened, or what's taken place. But what we do know is that verse 32 gives us what was left on the minds of these disciples. So verse 32 reads, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Right. So the moment which they saw Jesus and immediately he vanished, what did they just think about? What he said to them on the word. They remembered his, his word. They remembered that Christ said and he expounded the Lord's scriptures. Right. So as soon as they recognized Jesus, their first thought was the road. Their first thought was Jesus expounding God's word to them. And this, this expression of burning, right, really, it gives this idea of conviction and joy and hope. I think we've all been in church services where um, the preacher's preaching and our hearts are just burning. And it's quite hard to even describe. And maybe the burning could be conviction of sin or maybe the burning could be a hope or maybe even the burning where you're not even a believer but you're starting to think, oh wait, this could be true, right? The moment in which you're sitting here thinking, okay, if this is true, then I have to give up everything and follow Jesus. That's just that, that moment where our hearts are burning, right? The Holy Spirit was moving on the hearts of these disciples, bringing conviction, joy, and hope. John P P Piper said this of this verse, says, this is the goal of expository exaltation. The goal of spirit-anointed preaching, a heart burning with passion for Christ, his glory, his word, and his mission. Right? This is what we all want when we sit under God's word. We all want our hearts to burn within us and our, and our hearts to burn for the Lord Jesus Christ. So why is this supper significant for us? Right? Why is, I say this story, I say what's happened here, but why is, like, what does it mean for us? It means that the Lord can not only correct our misplaced hopes, but he is our hope. He provides a better hope that we can build a house on. Right. We see that he opened the eyes of, of these disciples and their first thought was be reminded of the word of Christ. And the word of Christ ultimately points them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to put our hope on him and him alone. But that's what happens when, if we do this, then that means that when we do hope in maybe the smaller things, then, we, then our faith isn't ruined, right? We, we don't hope that the Lord may heal us, heal us and, we attack that, and we say that's what God does. He always heals. And if that doesn't come to pass, what happens? Your faith fails. But it has to be something greater than that. So not only do we see the journey to Emmaus, right? We're almost done. Journey to Emmaus, supper at Emmaus. Now we see the journey from Emmaus, right? Their round trip. So verse 33 reads, and they rose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. Now, something that I didn't mention, you probably caught in the passage, is that one of the reasons that they gave Jesus to come stay with them, because it was late, right? It was very, it was late. Or it was, I think it said the, 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 the day was far spent. That is to say that they most likely walked to, on, on, they walked to Emmaus during late, the late afternoon. They got to Emmaus and maybe it was getting dark. They had supper, so most likely right now it's pitch black, right? And this is, this is not like London, right? We don't have lamp, lamp, lamp posts in the first century Jerusalem. So it's pitch black. But they chose to leave in that very moment, right? So maybe they had their um, lamps of oil and they were running back to Jerusalem. Seven miles, right? So it's... A walk, if you're walking there, it's two and a half hours. Maybe they shaved off one hour, maybe. I don't know how fast they're running. But they ran back into Jerusalem with hope that was in their mouths. Right? They wanted to proclaim the hope that Christ is risen. So they probably didn't um, run back until we leaped back. They were excited. Right? They were hopeful. Their journey to Emmaus was marked by hopelessness and just sorrow, and their, and their journey from Emmaus was marked by a confident hope that Christ indeed has risen. 
that he is alive. He got up. He, he really did beat death. He got up. And their hearts, as, as they were moving on that journey, were burning and convicted and hopeful and joyful at what the Lord has done. So they arrive at Jerusalem. And, of course, the 11 disciples were, were there and everyone was together, everyone was excited, and everyone said, yeah, the Lord indeed has risen, right? Christ has risen from the grave. And he also said that the Lord appeared to Simon as well. Right? This is not, in the gospel, this, this is not accounted for. We don't read the particular moment where Christ first appeared to Simon. But we see that Simon or, or Peter and many of the disciples went on to do magnificent things for the Lord, as a result of Christ's strategic appearing to them. Um, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe Christ vanished from the sacks of the two disciples in order to maybe appear to Cephas. We're not, we're not sure. But it's clear that Jesus particularly had a particular reason as to why he appears to some people, not others. So in this story, we see two hopeless, sorrowful, sad disciples journey back with their hopes restored and their, and their mouths full of hope. They, proclaimed, they wanted to proclaim the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 17 and verse 21 speak of the sadness and hopelessness that they felt. And at the end of the chapter, verse 52, we read that they had great joy, right? So we've come full circle. And Thomas though he's not in this particular story, he gets a really bad rap. Everyone says, doubt and Thomas. And I just wonder in heaven <laughs> how he feels about, about that. Right? But Thomas has probably the most ride or die passage or, or kind of verse or speech in the entirety of the New Testament. Right? And I'm not, I'm not sure if you, if, if, you, if you recall this, but in John 11, right, so Christ hears that Lazarus is dead, and he wants to go back to visit um, them, to, to visit, visit him. And basically, he just, left, he, he, he just left to Judea, where he experienced intense persecution. Right? And in verse 8 of John 11, um, they say to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Right? And then in verse 16, to skip down, verse 16, it says, So Thomas, called a twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Right? So basically, Christ was going to suffer somewhere. The disciples were like, What are you doing, Jesus? And Thomas said to them, Come on, let's go so we may die with him. Right? This guy was all in, 100% in. So it, it makes sense his response when Thomas saw Jesus, right? Because we've all felt where we've hoped in something so much and for our hopes to be dashed, to hope again, right? Where we just, we give everything to something. Like we, we, we say, this is my, my, my all. And then for us to see that kind of fall and crumble. And when the opportunity to hope again is presented, it's scary because we don't want to feel like what we, what we felt before. So it, is, so it makes sense how Thomas was like, no, come, we, I, I, I will not believe. I refuse to believe unless I put my finger in his side, right? So it's this idea that hope is a difficult thing because when, we've been, when our hopes have been dashed and, we, and we're called upon to hope again, it's tough. But Jesus' response to Thomas was an encouraging thing, right? He, he brought him close. Barbara King Solver, the American novelist, said, said this, the very least you can do in your life is to figure out what to hope for or what you should hope for. And the most you can do is to live inside that hope, not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its roof. Right? That is to say, if hope was a house and if Christ was our hope, it's not enough for us to look at the front garden, right? To see how the flowers are arranged 
or to see how the patio work looks like, or to see the structure of the building and say, oh, this is pretty good. It's not enough for us to go maybe around the back garden and to see how the garden looks like and to see how the back of the house looks like. The, the only hope that we have is for us to go inside that building, that home, and to live in and to lodge in and to abide in there. Because only then, if we are in this house, can we ever go through life turbulence of difficulty. Difficulty out there and difficulty in here. Right? We are faced with sin in our lives. If we're faced with sin out there, we're facing the world with the world and the devil. And if we are going to persevere and to have hope, our hope must be in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something that the Lord calls us to. And when I think about hope, I think about the feeling that how I feel right now will not always be the case. Right? That the feeling that you feel right now won't always be the case. And we have to be reminded that Christ offers us a sure and better hope, that we can be confident that we, even in our struggles, even in our struggles with sin, even our struggles within our marriages, even in our struggles in general, we can be confident that we are looking to a, a greater and better confidence, that we will be with him for eternity, that we will stand face to face, that he will embrace us, that he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, those, that, that's to the believers. But maybe there's people in this room who are still looking, out, looking outside. They, maybe they come to church on a regular basis. They view the garden. Right? They view the house. They maybe even take pictures. Maybe their phone is dominated by pictures of this house. But yet they haven't really stepped in. They haven't really made their, this home a place for them to stay, to abide in. Right? This is a call for you to escape the winds of God's wrath and to offer yourself, to cast yourself upon the mercies of Lord Jesus Christ, to not have confidence in maybe how we used to go to church or maybe even our Christian education, but to recognise that we are nothing without the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have confidence that Christ in his mercy, in his grace, will welcome, will welcome, welcome us in. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this um, reminder of your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our greatest hope, that all other hopes are misplaced if it's not placed in you. Lord, we pray Lord, that you may ground us, encourage us, keep us going. And we pray, Lord, that you, Lord, may gain all the glory and all the honour. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.